Unit 8, Land Availability and Growing Conditions. Part 1, Land Availability. We're going to discuss land for urban agriculture in this unit. Um, finding land for urban, urban agriculture can be a challenge for several reasons. One, vacant land may be rare in certain urban areas. Urban vacant land may be what's known as a brownfield, which we'll discuss in more detail later. And land for urban agriculture may have to be in multiple small sites or vacant lots rather than large single uh, unit sites. And if sufficient land is not available, it might be necessary to use alter alternate growing strategies, such as container gardening, vertical gardening, or indoor gardening. <clears throat> First, decide on the type of growing that needs to be done, or that will be done, and then do a land needs analysis. To do a land needs analysis, divide the urban agriculture into segments. Home gardens, community gardens, commercial Outdoor farms, commercial indoor farms, those can be subdivided into hydroponics or aquaponics or containers, etc. And obviously, indoor farms don't need the same land availability as outdoor farms, and home gardens generally have some land available because they're at someone's home. Outdoor growing. We're going to assume for the purposes of this unit that we're discussing growing crops outdoors or in hoop houses in the ground for either commercial growing or community gardens. We need to locate tracts of land on which to locate our urban agriculture project. Think outside the plot. That is, it might be possible to accomplish our goal by using several smaller plots rather than a single larger growing area. Think of city govern governments as partners, not adversaries. With the current trend toward urban agriculture, most cities will gladly work with agricultural entrepreneurs to help locate suitable growing sites especially if jobs may be created and may help with things such as soil testing or remediation if required. <clears throat> Speaking of soil testing, soil used for growing crops should be tested for nutrients, the macronutrients, phosphorus and potassium, as well as micronutrients. Soil can be tested for nitrogen, the third macronutrient, but its presence in soil is quite ephemeral and test results aren't meaningful uh, in the long term. So nitrogen is usually not really measured or the results apply for the first crop that you plant and then not beyond that. Um, soil should be tested for structure and composition. Uh, if you have a heavy clay soil, you're going to need to amend that soil in some way to uh, increase your yields to make it suitable for growing plants. And it should be tested for the presence of contaminants. Because urban soils have often been subjected to contamination in the form of heavy metals, fuels, and other chemicals, testing for the presence, presence of contaminants is important. Contaminant testing cannot be done with consumer soil test kits, however. The soil samples must be sent to a soil testing laboratory to have this testing done. This photograph is a consumer soil testing kit. And with a basic kit such as this, one can test for the macronutrients, nitrogen, um, phosphorus, and potassium, as well as soil pH. These kits are not able to test for micronutrients or contaminants. <clears throat> this is a soil penetrometer, and it's used for testing soil structure uh, and hardness. However, for most of our purposes, just digging into the soil or trying to dig into the soil with a shovel will give a good indication of the need for adjusting the soil structure though you can get very accurate readings of soil hardness and density um, with a device such as this. Brownfields, which I mentioned earlier, we're going to discuss a little bit more now. 
this is not necessarily unique to urban agriculture, but more urban land um, is considered to be a brownfield than rural land. A brownfield is land that's previously been used for industrial purposes, and the term generally implies a low level of contamination with hazardous waste or other pollutants and often are marked for remediation and redevelopment. What that means is that you may be able to find lists of brownfield sites, or you might be able to look up your particular site on such a list to see if it's a brownfield. The term is not usually applied to areas that are heavily contaminated, such as the EPA Superfund sites. Many states, as well as the EPA, maintain a list of known brownfield sites that have been identified, and many have been marked for remediation and development. Such lists are not all inclusive, however, as any site has the potential to be classed as brownfield if it's been subject to some type of contamination. <clears throat> this is a photograph of a typical brownfield. What we see is some type of industrial building, a large vacant area of land surrounding it. It's quite likely that this land was used, for instance, for parking trucks or equipment. It's been subjected to leaking fuel or oil. It may have been used um, as storage for toxic chemicals or something like that. So it's uh, something that we need to check for and test for. Leaking underground storage tanks, or LUSTs, as they're referred to in the industry, the building industry, um, are a particularly bad form of contamination. This a contamination is often much more intense because these tanks may have been leaking for a long period of time. And it's you never know what was in the tank. Um, many of them simply contain uh, fuel, diesel fuel or oil or something like that. Um, others may have contained more toxic chemicals. Brownfield remediation. Remediation is the process of taking something and restoring it to the condition it was in before it was contaminated or polluted. Um, the United States EPA and most states have departments dedicated to brownfield remediation. Brownfields, and remember we're talking about low levels of contaminants, um, brownfields can be remediated and they can be used as site for, sites for urban agriculture. In addition, grants are available to help with the cost of remediation. What needs to be done is the contaminant needs to be identified and then the type of remediation needs to be chosen. There are lots of techniques available for soil and water remediation and the specific techniques that are used on any particular site depend upon one, money available, two, the time available to do the remediation, three, the degree of remediation required. Some sites require much more effort than others. Four, the amount and location of contaminated soil or water and five, simply personal preference. We're going to now discuss some types of remediation, remediation techniques. Phytoremediation is the first one we'll talk about. Phytoremediation means using plants to remove contaminants. Some species of plants are known as hyperaccumulators and will accumulate large amounts of toxins and pollutants in their tissues, um, typically heavy metals and phytoremediation can be an effective way to remove heavy metals from the soil. The plants are then removed from the site by cutting or mowing. So what happens is the site is planted or seeded, typically seeded, with plants known to be hyperaccumulators for the type of contaminant in the soil. The plants are allowed to grow as they grow, they accumulate, they pull those 
uh, contaminants from the soil into their own tissues. The plants are then cut down and removed from the site. They're often disposed of as toxic waste. Um, and the process is repeated until the contaminants are reduced to the required level. The plants may then be treated themselves or buried in toxic waste disposal sites. Bioremediation. Bioremediation is the use of microorganisms to remove pollutants. This type of remediation, like phytoremediation, is usually done in situ, which means the contaminated soil is left on site as opposed to being removed to a processing facility. Unlike phytoremediation, in which the contaminants are removed from the soil and accumulate in plants, bioremediation organisms actually break down the contaminants into less toxic or non-toxic components. The site to be remediated is inoculated with the appropriate microorganisms which break down the contaminants. And these microorganisms that we're referring to here typically are bacteria. Fungi are also microorganisms, but deserve a category of their own, microremediation. Microremediation uses fungi to break down contaminants, similar to the way bioremediation uses other microorganisms. Fungi can grow very rapidly, and their mycelia can penetrate virtually any size pore in the soil. They um, emit chemicals, proteins typically, that attack the contaminants in the soil and break them down into less harmful or harm harmless substances. And this is a relatively new technique, but it's rapidly gaining favor. And there are genetic engineering approaches that involves genetic engineering of microorganisms, primarily bacteria, to break down contaminants. Organisms that are modified in this way may be made to eat contaminants that they would not otherwise be able to consume. So you can take a bacteria that may normally exist in the soil in the type of conditions, um, minus the contamination, splice in genes that allow them to attack and consume the contaminants and further break them down. And uh, they can also produce proteins that bind to or chemically change contaminants. So there are two types of approaches with genetic engineering approaches um, to this remediation issue. Finally, for this section, there are some points to ponder. Because of being marked as brownfields, many sites might be available for very low cost, even if the level of contamination is quite low. So you may be able to save significant money in the purchase of a site if it's been marked as brownfield. In addition, most states and the federal government have departments or agencies that can provide expertise and even financial support, such as grants or uh, very low interest loans, um, for remediation. And even some cities have set up systems to help with brownfield issues. They're anxious to get these properties productive again and back on the tax rolls. Low levels of some contaminants are quite easily remediated and the soil can be entirely suitable for growing. Other contaminants may make it completely unsuitable, so you have to take care to identify the particular contaminant. And the most common contaminant in brownfields is hydrocarbons from motor fuel and motor oil, and that is relatively easy to remediate. So even though space may be marked as a brownfield, it might not necessarily preclude it from being used as urban agriculture. The money that you save in purchasing it um, can go towards remediation, but you can also receive financial aid for the government from the government to help make this land productive again. And that's the end of part one of this unit.